culture, uh, which we'll say more about um, in just a second. But um, first, we want to thank some folks who have made this year's lecture possible, especially as a hybrid event. First and foremost is uh, Dean Carolyn Hoover, uh, Dean of the Humanities and Social Sciences Division. She provided the funding for this event. She um, you know, uh, basically secured that uh, from SEEP, as I recall. And uh, without her, it just wouldn't be happening. And so we're really, really uh, happy that she was able to drop by and let us thank her in person for her role in that. Associate Dean Lance Hurd uh, also played a, an important role in that and uh, attended a meeting uh, that we had. Uh, Raul Madrid, my colleague from the Geography and Political Science Department, um, uh, who uh, has brought so much dynamism and intellectual firepower to our department and who we're really grateful to have in our midst, uh, was at that meeting and uh, established the first contact with the, the uh, Lacey team members, the Los Angeles Clean Tech Institute team members uh, who are going to be presenting here today after we hear from Mount Sac's own team, uh, our sustainability team, who we're very, very proud of and feel extremely fortunate to have uh, Professor Tanya Anders, uh, our new sustainability coordinator, and Ira Baptuali, our new sustainability director. And so this uh, really puts Mount Sac uh, on a very um, you know, expedited path with a very firm foundation for sustainability on campus. And uh, I, just, I was at a presentation with Ira just yesterday, and I can only tell you that her presentation was the best like by far of any of the six people who presented. And I don't want to say that out loud in front of them because I don't want to hurt their feelings. Um, but, you know, it's just among friends here. And I can say that in front of Ira and not worry. I might embarrass her, uh, but I'm not going to hurt her feelings, at least. I could say that much. So uh, we really appreciate the support of uh, Dean Hoover. And um, I, should, I would be remiss if I didn't also thank President Scroggins because he was really responsible for uh, finding the funds that made it possible to make Tanya's position full time and uh, to, make, uh, to hire ERA. And uh, I would also be remiss if I didn't mention Mika Klein, uh, who you know, we sadly lost um, to an early heart attack. Uh, as I understand it, I'm, I'm, I might not be exactly right about the cause of her early passing, but Mika was only in her early 50s, so we were very saddened by her loss, and um, that was compounded by the fact that she was such a, a champion of sustainability at Mount Sac, and uh, everything, you know, she was a passionate believer in, um, you know, doing uh, everything with students in mind, with serving students in mind. And uh, to the president's credit and the college's credit, they held a, a beautiful memorial service. There were probably over 200 people in attendance in the new football stadium. And uh, you look around campus, you look at the new student center that's going up, so many of the buildings on campus, Mika had a hand in designing. And uh, Mika was key to persuading President Scroggins that ERA was the person, you know, to hire as our new sustainability director, and, and right she was. She was so absolutely right about that. And uh, so uh, we basically stole her from HMC Architects that played such a key role in helping to design some of the buildings on campus, uh, so, so many of our uh, LEED certified buildings, and um, uh, in helping to uh, put together our first ever climate action plan. So with that said, um, let me uh, move on to introducing our two speakers. And uh, by way of introduction, I just want to show you a rendering of what the new student center is uh, actually supposed to look like when it's finished. So you've seen it. You know, as it's been constructed, it seems like it's been going on forever, uh, but this is what it's supposed to look like when it's finished. So um, let me go ahead and uh, introduce uh, Ira and Tanya. So um, first, Ira, as Director of Sustainability at Mount San Antonio College, Ira is on a mission to decrease the college's carbon footprint with a larger goal of getting 
to net zero by 2050. So uh, in terms of our greenhouse gas emissions through the implementation of the college's climate action plan. And uh, I already mentioned that the, it, there's a website, you can Google it, you can find it and uh, look at it for yourself, but it's over 200 pages. So uh, don't be intimidated. Ira works across the campus with faculty, staff, and students to implement meaningful sustainability measures. She is currently engaged in implementing a campus-wide organics collection program, identifying incentives for the addition of more electric vehicle charging stations on the north side of campus. Some of you might be interested in that, and initiating a decarbonization plan so that the college can, um, can reduce its reliance on fossil fuels and eventually eliminate them altogether. So I expect we'll probably hear more about that uh, in just a second. She is also co-chair of the U.S. Green Bil Building Council in Inland Empire, where she facilitates sustainability workshops for schools. And she is a board member of the Designing Futures Foundation, where she seeks to support community projects with a sustainable focus. So we are lucky to have Ira on our campus as our new sustainability director. And next, allow me to introduce um, Professor Tanya Anders, um, who's a professor of geology and oceanography in the Natural Sciences Division. Uh, she's also the sustainability coordinator for Mount SAC, and she basically helps to incorporate uh, sustainability into the curriculum, across the curriculum, and she uh, will explain more about that. So I'll leave um, what I said uh, to that. She is excited to provide leadership by supporting faculty working to embed sustainability into their courses. She regularly offers faculty professional development opportunities and has the dream of seeing sustainability taught across all divisions and disciplines of the campus. Her hope is that Mount SAC will be able to offer a sustainability program for students in the near future. She has shown a professional interest in our planet's past, present, and future for over 25 years. For her graduate studies, she researched isotopic signals of marine microorganisms and the stories they tell about climate change on Earth. So she's primarily focused on oceanography. And I was at the Long Beach Aquarium not too long ago when I was imagining, imagining that she had been there a few times. Like many others in her lifetime, she has observed changes on our planet. Population numbers have more than doubled. She has seen the ice coverage over Greenland shrink based on scientific observations, both from space and on the ground. Through education, she helps to increase awareness for a sustainable future and hopes that Earth will remain a wonderful home for many generations to come. So uh, with that said, allow me to welcome Tanya Anders uh, and Ira Babtwali uh, to the stage here. Thank you so much, James, for the very kind introduction. So now we just need to switch it to our PowerPoint. Let's see. There we go. Okay. Um, so Ira and I want to um, give um, you all a introduction to sustainability here at Mount SAC, um, focusing on the three spheres of sustainability, which is people, planet, and prosperity. So, so I'm a Mac user, here we go. There we go. <laughs> um, so um, the th three spheres, as you can see here, they overlap and really at the center of it, that's where we have a sustainable life. I've added a fourth P to it, the place. So people and place go together. Um, and then we have the planet and prosperity. And so uh, James already mentioned, for example, the professional development course that we have for faculty. And I really always wanna emphasize that this is an opportunity for really all faculty from across campus to embed sustainability into their curriculum. One of the um, themes that we, we use is um, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and um, you'll see them on upcoming slides, and they really touch on all areas of our lives. And so we, we cannot have a sustainable life, for example, if we don't also have prosperity, right? <laughs> because... Um, we, we need food on our tables, right? Um, and so that's kind of the theme we're gonna use as we go through our, our presentation. And we're gonna start with, um, I really don't know which one of these buttons helps to move the slides forward. Nope. 
They are not wanting to move. Oh, let me see. Well. Which one did she do? Oh, oh it looks like it's configured a little bit differently. <laughs> well, you fit, you did move it. Nope. No. Well, one time. Not on the screen. Let me see something here. Did you open it through the um this right here? Are you clicking on the right? <laughs> what? Yeah. Let's, let's uh, maybe click the mouse. Oh. it and start it again. Um, yeah, but anyway, I did open it in PowerPoint viewing mode. Well, this is James' presentation again. Let's see. There we go. Okay, how about we go to the next one? Okay, so, well, you see us both standing up here already. So we um, just wanted to introduce ourselves again. So um, as James mentioned, I'm the sustainability coordinator for the campus. So that's an academic senate appointed position. Um, comes with a little bit of release, not full time. So I still do teach and do other things. Um, but of course, I'm super excited to, to lead the effort in incorporating an, um, sustainability into our, our curriculum. So if you have questions, there is my contact information. And um, Ira, I'll let you introduce yourself. Sure. So I have the pleasure of working with many people, especially Tanya Anders. Um, my role is to be Director of Sustainability for the campus, um, and that really means looking at everything that we do in terms of operations, everything that we use on campus, how everybody interacts with the campus, and how we can make that more sustainable. And so since we're focusing on people, first of all, we want to introduce some more people. So if you want to briefly come up here, at least to show your, yourself. So um, our associated students, um, they have an environmental senator and we have a brand new environmental senator, um, Charlie Yang. And so we wanted to at least have you guys be able to show yourselves. It's um, We have so few opportunities these days to to come together as a group. And um, so there's Charlie. And then we also have, um, yay. We have representatives here from our Eagle Club on campus. So that stands for Environmental Action Group for a Livable Earth. And so we have Gladys and Eric here. So thank you so much for all you do for, for our campus, um, not everybody might know that, for example, the very first water filling stations that we have here on our campus, that was initiated because of the engagement of students. So students have a strong voice on our campus, and uh, so we, we appreciate everything you do to um, make our campus the best it can be. Thank you, guys. We also have more people engaged on our campus. Um, and one of the groups that I wanted to mention is the Climate Commitment and Environmental Justice Committee, uh, which meets every second Friday of the month uh, from 10 to noon. We're currently meeting by Zoom, which is, of course, environmentally friendly. And everyone is welcome to come to our meetings. We have, of course, appointed members also, but we are really very open to having many, many folks there. And our students are also represented on that committee, as well as managers and faculty. And, and here I go again. <laughs> um, so more about people, you, the students. Um, we have a sustainability, a student sustainability award contest that we run every year. 
and I, we want to invite you to submit your work that you complete during an academic year. The um, website is housed um, on our library's website and um, Jarrett Burton, who you see here on the photo, he's a librarian, but he's also been the one who spearheaded the sustainability awards. He's coordinating those efforts and he put together this um, nice little video. So let me um, play that for you. Let's hope that this works and the sound works and all of that good stuff. So while we get this going, there's um, five categories. Um, each category, you can win $500. And like I said, you um, can submit. The, we don't have a deadline for submission. Um, and the next awards will be given next year during Earth Week. So that is the goal. And Yeah, click on the link. Let's make it larger. I do make it larger. It's not showing over there. You need to pause it. The sound, we can't hear the sound here. Keep technical difficulties. $500. You can. You can win $500 of five categories. So you can add. Hey, um, I noticed you're refilling your, your cup. Um, do you know anything about the sustainability awards by any chance? I'm oh, a student here. Nice to meet you. I'm a librarian here on campus and we love questions. But yeah, it turns out I'm the coordinator for the awards. So um, I can definitely help you find the website. That's awesome because I want to submit my project and I heard you could legit win $500. You can. You can win $500 of five categories. So you can actually win $500 in, in, uh, for each one. So um, yeah, let me show you how to get there. Here, I'll pull up. Cool, yeah, I'd, I'd love to know. All right, here's what you do. You go to the Mount SAC Libraries homepage, which is at mountsac.edu forward slash library. From the homepage, you go to the menu on the top right and you click Research Help. Then you click Research Guides. This will open a new page, and these are all of the library's research guides. We're gonna choose Earth, Environment, and Astronomy, and then we're going to choose Sustainability. This opens a new research guide that we can look at and use for researching sustainability in general. So take a look at this as you do your project. There's also this link here for Mount Sac Student Sustainability Awards. That's the one you want. Click there and it opens a new research guide. And here you can find all the information you need about the categories, submission guidelines, contest rules, and how to submit. Thanks so much. I'm, I really appreciate it. I'm going to check it out. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, do you have any other questions for me? Uh, yeah, when is the deadline for submission? Oh, great, great question. There's actually no deadline. We want students to submit like quality, um, completed work. So once you're done with your project and you've written the essay, submit those. Um, and winners will be announced next year in 2023 at the Mount Sac Earth Week celebrations. Um, the only real deadline is saving the planet. Thank you so much. I better get back to work then. Oh, have a you're good welcome. One. You too. Thanks. Thanks for your interest in the Mount SAC Student Sustainability Awards Contest. For any questions, please contact Jared Burton at the email address jburton6 at mountsac.edu. All right, so that's the sustainability awards for the students. Um, so please, please, um, if you're a faculty member, let your students know about the sustainability award contest. And if you are a student, please take note of this and um, please submit your proposals. Um, here are some examples of winners of the previous years. So we've had, um, for example, clothing made out of recycled material. Um, we have had uh, students um, clean 
um, parks. We have, can you move? <laughs> I keep hitting the wrong buttons. I'm just going to let you move the slides. Um, um, we have had students do scientific um, essays. Um, we have had students put together videos, um, posters. So there's a lot of different areas in which you can contribute. So that's for the students. For the faculty, as we mentioned, there's an opportunity for you to learn more about sustainability and embed sustainability into your curriculum. And we have a brand new a cohort starting on Monday. So if you are interested in taking this opportunity to earn a LEAF designation for your courses, then please join us on um, Monday from 3.30 to 5.30. And you see the other meeting dates there also. Um, you can earn professional growth increments hours for this or professional growth hours if you're an, um, a part-time faculty member and um, please um, register in pod connect um, and we'll get started next week with this um, course and so I'll turn it over to Ira okay thank you and um, welcome everybody again thank you so much James for that really warm welcome that was very kind um, we're really excited to be here with all of you in person today and virtually um, and Tanya shared with you, you know, one of the spheres of sustainability, and that has to do with people. That's all of us, all of you. The other two spheres um, are also going to be touched upon, but we wanted to make sure that we uh, further delve into um, that first sphere of people. And the other piece of that is place. So many of you might no, maybe you don't know that Mount SAC actually is quite invested when it comes to sustainability within our facilities. Um, we've actually engaged in a, quite a few of construction projects. I'm sure you've noticed the really big ones going on right now. But um, as a matter of fact, many of our existing buildings, fairly new buildings since about 2017 or so, have been designed to a standard known as LEAD, which is Leadership in Environmental and Energy Design. This building that we're in today here in person, um, Building 13, Design Tech, was actually designed to be LEAD Silver, and there are a myriad of other projects on campus that have also achieved this uh, rating, as well as LEAD Gold. Uh, the new athletics complex, the student center, the, the upcoming tech and health building, all of those are also going to strive to achieve a LEAD status, either gold or platinum. But we're really trying to push beyond this um, you know, new status quo of LEAD toward net zero. Uh, net zero is something that our state as a whole is really striving to achieve as well. And so Mount SAC is well positioned to become a champion in this effort as well um, and come off of our reliance of fossil fuels in terms of everything that we do, including the way we operate our buildings. Um, so that's something that we definitely think is, is worth mentioning in terms of sustainability as it pertains to place and that first sphere of people in place. Um, so here you see a list of a number of LEED certified buildings, either new or existing um, and up and coming. And you can see them uh, happening um, in in the life, in the in, in, in present, um, we have the new two the two new uh, parking structures across the way on Temple, which by the way house 59 new EV charging stations. Those, those are free to use. It's something we're really proud to be able to provide as an amenity to our students, to our staff, to our faculty, and as a matter of fact, to our community. It is free for anybody to use. So if you're interested in learning about that, please do see me um, or check out our website. Um, and you know, we have many built examples of sustainability on campus, but we also have unbuilt examples. Uh, we have the beautiful West Parcel Habitat Mitigation Project, which has just been completed, as a matter of fact, in terms of initiation this week. And for the next five years, we'll be looking and taking care of this habitat um, to ensure that uh, local flora and fauna are being supported through natural vegetation. So why this is such an important project is because Mount Sac as a college had the opportunity to either develop this into a built project, a building, a parking structure, solar panels even, but the college made a very conscious effort to actually make this a restoration project and restore about eight parcel, eight acres worth of land to their natural state. That's an amazing testament to the commitment that Mount Sac has to the environment and to all of us as part of that environment. That um, 
parcel is going to help sequester carbon over the long run. It's going to support the local gnat catcher, which is an endangered bird species. Um, it's going to support us um, in terms of our curriculum as well. So much of the curriculum that Tanya was talking about can actually be supported through that space as a living laboratory. So we're just really proud and really excited that that unbuilt project is also a testament to sustainability. A few more glimpses, we have a transit center that's coming online, so everybody who wants to get to Mount Sac in a more sustainable way using mass transit will have the ability to do so very, very soon. And then we have the farm, which also houses a sustainable demonstration garden located just behind Building 40. If you guys haven't been to the farm, I highly recommend you go take a visit there, take your family there, and see the wonderful work that's being done, including the sustainable demonstration garden and the community garden, um, which are all wonderful examples of how we can actually uh, support local fauna and flora within our own homes and our own backyards and on our campus. And of course, the wildlife sanctuary. So I don't know how many of you have been to the sanctuary that we have here on campus, but it is a beautiful resource. As a matter of fact, there's a tour tomorrow. And if you were one of the lucky 50 people who signed up for it, sorry, it capped off at 50, um, congratulations. But if you haven't had the opportunity to register for that, uh, you can always contact the co-directors, uh, Tyler Flissick and Mark Cooper, the co-directors, both professors in biology here at Mount Sac, and they'd be more than willing to schedule a tour for a small group for you. Um, um, it consists of 26 acres of natural habitat that's going to be kept um, intact for the life of the campus. Again, a huge testament to our commitment to sustainability here at Mount Sac. It includes various ecosystems, including um, uh, the beautiful oak and walnut trees that you see around campus, as well as uh, coastal sage scrub, riparian woodlands, grasslands, and three separate bodies of water. So again, another amazing opportunity to use our campus as a living laboratory. Professors from biology, from econ, from culinary arts, anywhere can really use this facility. Here's a, a little bit more information in regarding resources. Um, if you ever want to visit the sanctuary or want to learn how you can use that for your classes. And we want to touch on this other sphere of sustainability, which has to do with prosperity. So people don't often think of that um, and, and make the connection between their time here on campus and sustainability, but it is every much a part of the conversation as is energy savings or water savings. And our guests, our wonderful guests from Lacey, I think are going to touch upon how prosperity plays into the, the whole story of sustainability for sure in just a bit. But in terms of the amazing education that you can receive here at Mount Sac, um, it, it is as well very demonstrative of how prosperity, education, access to quality education here at Mount Sac is a, a key, is a center, centerpiece to sustainability. We are so excited about the LEAF courses that Tanya is working on, about the environmental science uh, study certificate that James and Raul are working on, and about our partnership with entities such as LACI, the Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator. And when it comes to sustainability, it's really about taking action at all scales. So the global scale, at the state scale, and right here at, on our own campus at Mount Sac. Tanya mentioned the sustainable development goals, and that's really become a rubric for us as we team together to dis, just figure out how we can um, allow sustainability to really permeate everything that we do in terms of curriculum and operations and even beyond. At the state level, we have California's own climate action plan, which is pledging to become carbon-free electric by 2045. So great systems are in place for us to, to lean on. And then the California Community College System, the CCCs, they've released their own sustainability and climate action policy in 2021. Um, seven different categories that really challenge all of the community colleges to up their game in terms of sustainability. And right here at Mount Sac, we have our own climate action plan. James mentioned it earlier. It was published in 2018. If you want to peruse 200 pages of, of pleasure reading, I invite you to. I find it riveting, personally. It's available as a link on our own website, our sustainability website, so please do give it a, give it a look. And actually, we'll be embarking in a revision of our climate action plan this year. Tanya and I are going to be looking at how we can sit down and put a timeline together with different focus groups. If you're interested in being part of that initiative, please do let us know. We'll be happy to invite you into the conversation. And that, cl that climate action plan required us to take a really hard look at our carbon footprint here at Mount Sac. 
carbon footprinting looks at three different scopes. So I just provided a, a quick glimpse of what those scopes look like. Scope one are direct emissions from natural gas. Scope two are direct emission are indirect emissions rather from purchased electricity, in our case, SoCal Edison. And then scope three is basically a catch-all. So waste, landfill waste specifically, and the methane emissions released into the atmosphere as a result of that waste. Transportation, how you are getting to campus, how I'm getting to campus, how everybody else is getting to campus, and even how we invest. So scope three is, again, a catch-all. So looking at all three of those scopes, we were able to really assess our carbon footprint over the last few years from 2018 and 2021. And what a set of interesting years, right? I mean, COVID right in the middle. And you can see that scope three, that gray piece of the pie chart, significantly decreased over the last few years because not as many people, of course, were traveling to our campus, right? Um, in addition, over the last few years, we saw a significant decrease in scope one and scope two emissions. So how much energy our buildings were using because we weren't operating those buildings at full tilt. We weren't occupying those buildings at full tilt either. What this tells us that, you know, there are lots of lessons learned that we can grab from the last few years and then begin to implement looking forward. You know, we have a blended hybrid system in terms of learning now. Um, and so there's a new way to operate. There are more efficient ways to operate. Um, and there are different, definitely different ways that we can begin to optimize our building use. Um, and it gives me a lot of hope because with this as our baseline, perhaps we can forge a more sustainable future together. We will be uh, initiating a decarbonization plan this year. Um, and that's again going to provide us with a roadmap for how we can come off of our reliance from fossil fuels and truly be self-reliant, self-sustaining, um, and forge a sustainable future together. So I think that was it. That's all what we wanted to share for today. But we wanted to maybe we wanted to circle back to people and ask our um, leadership team here from Eagle to come up and say a few words also. Thank you all for coming. We quickly wanted to say thank you to those who organized this event and made it possible. So we just wanted to acknowledge that before we begin. Uh, we are so excited to present Eagle. And before we present about Eagle, we quickly wanted to introduce ourselves. So my name is Gladys. I am a student here at Mount SAC. And my officer role for Eagle is ICC representative. So I just talk within other clubs. And so we communicate back and forth. But we all share like different roles. It's not just one person that's this role. We all contribute. And here I have. Uh, hello, my name's uh, Eric. I am uh, the vice president for Eagle. I've been coming to campus for five years, uh, long time. Uh, I've been a part of Eagle for the past three, holding multiple dif uh, different uh, office positions as well, and yeah. Um, <clears throat> so uh, our mission as in Eagle is to sort of spread awareness about the environment and different uh, environmental topics that are happening around us. Um, we also like to uh, start discussions, sort of inform people, like start, start getting the ball rolling. Uh, we also like to get people motivated in our community to actually go out there and uh, participate in different uh, communities or er, communal services such as cleanups, uh, walks, stuff like that for the environment. Um, these are some of our past uh, evening topics. We've discussed about oil spills, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, fire ecology, and uh, just different things. We like to try to touch base on whatever our uh, members are interested in learning at that uh, particular semester. Uh, and these are just a few of our uh, past events. Uh, we've done a plant drive for our wildlife sanctuary. Uh, we have used to do, uh, we used to invite a survival expert uh, for our Earth Week events. Uh, we also do camping trips as well. And we do utilize our uh, sanctuary uh, to do different tours and do cleanups in there as well. 
So I quickly wanted to touch on the fact that we accept students who have all different types of knowledge. So if you come to us, you have absolutely no knowledge. We will be the ones to guide you and show you like, hey, come with us. We have these events. We have these topics. If you're curious about any environmental topic, we will be sure to touch on that as well. Um, such as Eric was talking about the Granite Sweeney Mountain. I went on this camping trip last semester, or no, last year, and it was really fun. We were able to collect data on the Mojave Yucca and just collaborate with the different organizations there. So it was just tons of fun. These are again more photos. So we had a hiking trip. This was an environmental festival that we had this past Tuesday. We had a trash recycling sorting. So you had to grab, see, test your knowledge on what is recyclable versus what is not. And we also want to emphasize the fact that every day is Earth Day, not just one day out of the year. And here you can follow us and catch up on more information. You, there's our email. It's eaglemountsac at gmail. This is where we'd be releasing information on future events and catch up. I also post social, social media events on there, so you can catch up us on, on there as well. <laughs> That's it. Uh, that's it. Yes. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Well, I, uh, I thought as a segue into uh, the talk that we're about to hear from our Lacey keynote speakers that there were uh, a few uh, quotes here that were relevant to what they're going to say that sort of combine the environment with the economy because that's really the intersection that they reside at, at Lacey. And uh, so um, the first quote, as you see, is from uh, the comedian Lily Tomlin who said there's so much plastic in this culture that vinyl leopard skin is becoming an endangered synthetic. And Richard Pryor, uh, who said the way I see it, the earth is going to be here after we're dead and gone, even if it's a polluted planet and they messed it up. Where do you go from here to another planet so they can mess that up too? And uh, I think he, you know, uh, he had foresight into the Jeff Bezoses and the Elon Musks uh, that we have with us today. Um, Jim Hightower said, the water won't clear up until we get the hogs out of the creek. So he's a political humorist, and he's obviously talking about um, wealthy people and uh, big corporations who uh, exercise a lot of undue influence on the political system. There was a great frontline special on big oil uh, that I was watching just this past Tuesday evening. So uh, Franklin Roosevelt, um, is who we remember in association, in association with the New Deal. And uh, he said our greatest primary task is to put people to work. And he also observed that a nation that destroys its souls, soils, destroys itself, forests are the lungs of our land, purifying the air and giving fresh strength to our people. And this reminds us that the environment is a source of wealth and protecting it um, contributes to economic uh, vitality and uh, growth as well as uh, you know being a cost uh, to a society. So I think that that's a really relevant point um, in terms of where we are today. And this uh, point I think bears directly on what Daniel and Mike are going to say, uh, which is the, um, the stalling of the Build Back Better Act in the Senate, about which I think Mark Twain said it best uh, he said, readers, suppose you were an idiot and suppose you were a member of Congress, but I repeat myself. <laughs> so uh, without further ado, let me go ahead and uh, let us go ahead and introduce Daniel Ferguson and Mike Kelly.
Yeah, we are so excited to have both of you here today. Um, I'm Professor Raul Madrid. I uh, see a couple of my students in here, so happy you're here, and hopefully you're in virtual land out there as well. Uh, I'll be introducing uh, Daniel Ferguson today uh, as part of our keynote speakers. Uh, Daniel Ferguson serves as a senior director of workforce development uh, at the Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator, LACI. Uh, Daniel has uh, 10 years of workforce development experience in assisting at-risk and unemployed youth and young adults. Uh, prior to coming to Lacey, he worked at Job Corps for six years. In his last uh, role at Job Corps, uh, as the director of, of operations, he had oversight of KPIs, training, compliance, I mean, you name it. Um, and during his tenure, he was ranked number one in the nation uh, for contract performance. He's also an adjunct uh, professor for the School of Business Management at National University and an, a fellow LA native uh, who resides in Lamert Park with his wife and two, ch two children. So life is very busy for you. I can attest to that. Uh, Daniel has uh, earned his B, uh, MBA uh, from the Graduate School of Nonprofit uh, Management at American Jewish University. He also has a Bachelor's uh, of Arts in Sociology from Cal State LA. Since joining Lacey, he has developed an affinity for clean technology and enjoys assisting LA County uh, residents with securing good paying green jobs uh, through initiatives such as Advancing Prototyping uh, Center uh, Fellowship. So Daniel, it's really a, a pleasure to have you here and I'll leave it to James here to, uh, to introduce uh, your colleague. Mike Kelly is um, the Los Angeles Clean Tech Institute's Jobs Pipeline Manager. Mike is responsible for building relationships with startups and other green economy businesses to facilitate employment opportunities for Lacey's Fellowship participants. He earned his BA in Economics and Psychology from Lafayette College. Prior to Lacey, he worked at Community Coalition in a communications role, which included elevating South Los Angeles residents and small businesses' uh, business perspectives to support the organization's land use and economic development policy campaigns. He started in the LA nonprofit world at Chrysalis, assisting clients with their employment searches. Originally from Pittsburgh, he's now called Los Angeles home for seven years and is passionate about ensuring that those who are too often excluded from economic growth opportunities have access to good jobs. And that's really the mission of Lacey and we're very fortunate to have them here today. Thank you everyone for your patience. We'll, we'll be getting started shortly. <laughs>
but also in Daniel's. Alright, we are live. Okay. Um, share. And who should I uh, share this with? Okay, put in E. B A P. B A P. Mm-hmm. T I. Oh, actually, it's A B. Okay. What is it? Um, B A B. B A B. T I. difficulties I think are, you know, part and parcel with any presentation. Yeah, this is totally a part of the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> nice save. <laughs> <laughs> people part of sustainability too. So. Absolutely. Let me see how can let me see how can Thanks again for the patience. Your minds will be blown. <laughs> <laughs>
For um, Professor Madrid, Professor Stone, Professor Batawale, um, you, Professor, I'm sorry, I don't know your last name, but I definitely appreciate you. Um, and just this great opportunity. Um, funny story, I had no idea where Walnut, California was. I thought it was up north. So <laughs> I prepared for a long trip, <laughs> prepared for a little vacation. Um, but then I talked to a colleague, and they're like, oh, yeah, it's like 30, 45 minutes away. And I'm glad that it was only 45 minutes away because we just left Lacey, and we had the Secretary of Labor and Secretary of Energy visiting us today. So we had this big press conference. Um, and as you can imagine, for an introvert, after this, I will be done. Um, I will be hiding behind a rock somewhere. But nonetheless, it's great to be with you all today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, let's see here. It's on? Okay, testing, testing. Can y'all hear me? No. Okay. Oh, I think it's cut off. Let's see. There we go. There we go. Okay. Yeah. A lot better. Thank you. All right, so let's uh, get this show on the road here. Um, question. What year was this magazine published? This lovely Time magazine here. See, we've blocked out the date so you won't see it. Probably wouldn't be able to see it anyway from where you're at, but what year was this magazine published? Gives you a little context here, the future of work. What year was this published? 2016, okay, anyone else? All right, 2016, we have 2010, 2010, anyone else? 2010, 2011, okay. Any other guesses? 2005, 2007, actually May 2009, Time Magazine was published, The Future of Work, 
Now question, who was thinking about work looking different at this time in history? Like who could you imagine during 2009 that was considering the way that work would look a bit differently around this time? Google. General corporations? Google. Google, okay. And these are all great and correct answers. But we also forget about the folks that during this time of recession was looking to see how work will look. A lot of folks lost their jobs. And of course, we can really understand now, um, and of course, I might be dating myself a bit, but we saw how the pandemic affected work. But then we also saw the awareness and uptick in uh, green jobs, clean tech industry, and how prevalent and how important it was for the economy. Uh, but what caused our thinking to shift about work during this time was definitely the pandemic. Um, down here it says, throw away the briefcase, you're not going to the office. You can kiss your benefits goodbye too, and your new boss won't look much like your old one. There's no longer a ladder, and you may never get to retire, but there's a world of opportunity if you figure out a new path. Ten lessons for succeeding in the new American workplace. Wow. <laughs> Back then, we had no Zoom. I don't think we had Microsoft Teams. There's a possibility we might have had Skype. But was Skype really a viable option? Probably not, right? It was like the worst case scenario where everyone wanted to meet in person. So why do you think that I'm bringing this up today? Yeah, because we're here today, right? We're in the present future. And folks were thinking about the future of work back then. And if you can only imagine someone at home trying to figure out how do I communicate with my colleagues? There's no type of virtual conferencing experience. This is going to be quite stressful. But we found ourselves in the midst of the pandemic and we're still able to trek through. And I'm actually happy to say that Lacey grew exponentially during the pandemic. We went from 30 full-time employees to now 50 in the last two years during the height of the pandemic. But with that being said, I want to introduce you to our Enhancing Communities team. And then I'll get into detail about Lacey, why we exist, what we do. Um, thanks for the, the, the great introductions earlier, so you know Mike and I, but Estelle Reyes, our fearless leader, is our SVP of Enhancing Community. Sharon Segato is our Workforce Development Manager. Max Chan is our Community Partnerships Manager. Serenity Park is our Workforce Development Coordinator. And then you have Natalie here, who's our Community Engagement Manager. Uh, this is the team, our workforce development team as a whole. Um, just shy of six months ago, it was only four of us, and now we are growing to eight uh, folks on our team in the next month or so. And now I'll turn it over to Mike to introduce our practitioners and residents. Yeah, and thanks again for, for having us here. So our practitioners and residents are our case managers. And so uh, participants come through our training program. They're looking for resume support practice interview support, uh, looking for different job opportunities that are out there. And our PIRs are on the front lines of that. So they're working directly with participants and getting them job ready and helping them apply for this. And so in my role as a jobs pipeline manager, we'll be working very closely with the PIRs uh, because I'll be coordinating with businesses, they'll be coordinating with candidates, and then we merge the two into this beautiful uh, job placement. So this is Chris, Kiana, and Amanda, and they each bring different strengths to the table, which is so important. Awesome, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Can you all hear me okay? It's it's virtual. Oh, it's virtual. Oh, okay. <laughs> all right, sorry for the virtual folks out there. I want you to hear too. <laughs> all right, so what is Lacey? What do we do? What's our priorities? How do we strategize around our priorities? And what type of impact do we make in our local communities? So Lacey is a clean tech incubator. In other words, we incubate promising clean tech startups, right? So that's where our priorities lie. Uh, we are building an inclusive green economy. Uh, we're situated in the Arts District of downtown LA. How many of you have been to the Arts District downtown LA? It's a pretty cool place, right? Um, a lot of stuff is being developed around there, really good restaurants. Um, but nonetheless, Lacey is down there as well. By far the coolest place in the Arts District downtown LA. 
Our priorities, zero emissions, transportation, you know, electric vehicles, clean energy. Um, this is solar panels um, and electric vehicle charging stations, smart and sustainable cities, anything that's going to help to reduce the carbon footprint, help goods to move a lot more efficiently, and then also explore first and last mile options, and then also water and waste systems. Our strategies around these priorities is number one, unlocking innovation through startups. We incubate promising clean tech startups. We provide executive coaching to those startups and we help them to scale and bring their technology to market. Market transformation is exactly as it sounds. We want to transform the markets through strategically forming public-private partnerships. So our flagship, um, I would say, group is the Transportation Electrification Partnership. This includes the city of LA, the city of Culver City. Um, this also includes different startups, different companies like PCS Energies, and also Green Lots to help to shape how we're going to plan for the 2028 Olympics. So all that we do in the Transportation Electrification Partnership is helping to plan accordingly and then also during the height of the pandemic, we proposed the $150 billion um, stimulus plan uh, to make sure that we were not only able to create jobs, but also surge economic growth during that time as well. And then enhancing communities is the pillar in which Mike and I work under, which is all about enhancing communities, not only within our campus, but outside of our campus as well. Making sure that underrepresented groups are represented and engaged at every clean tech stage. That's from ideation, workforce, all the way to deployment. And out of these strategies yields impact like environmental, social, and then also economic as well. And so some of our impact is as follows. We're the top 10 rank incubator in the world by UBI since 2014. We've been able to help our startups raise about $465 million in funding generate $270 million in revenue. Over 2,100 jobs have been created, and we'll talk more about that in a bit. And $470 million estimated seven-year economic impact for the Los Angeles region. So our long-term goal, as mentioned, on the heels of our Green Jobs Report, which we'll go over in a little bit, is to create 600,000 green jobs in Los Angeles County by 2050. So why green jobs? Why are we focusing on green jobs? Obviously, there's definitely intrinsic value, but then there's also social and economic value as well. And we can see that the world is greening right before our eyes. Um, and so we want to make sure that everyone is included in this inclusive green economy. Uh, we do know this is ambitious, but we know it's achievable, but it can only happen with garnering partnerships like Mount SAC, other community colleges, labor, uh, workforce, private industry, academia, to make all of this possible. And we'll talk more about that in a bit. So the current state of green jobs in Los Angeles County, during the pandemic, um, there was definitely um, a time of reflection if green jobs was actually a thing because we saw significant job loss during the pandemic but we saw that the green economy immediately and swiftly corrected itself through stimulus, through encouragement, through pulling policy levers. So what is the current state of green jobs in LA County? So green jobs in LA County today account for about 338,000 of the jobs in Los Angeles County. So approximately one in 12 jobs in LA County are green jobs. So green jobs, which number about 178,000, are either businesses that directly produce green goods or services and traditional businesses that are directly responsible for producing a product. So look at the one, first definition as producing a product that is green. The second definition is supporting additional employment through supply chains and from household spending. So one is a product the other is a process. But within that, there's three types of green jobs that can be yielded from these two definitions. One being a direct job. If you actually work 
in a company and you have a green job, be it manufacturing, be it an electric vehicle technician, be it an electrical engineer, that's a green job. And then you have your indirect jobs, which are jobs that are support roles, maybe not with the company, but help to make sure that those products are being produced, that services are being rendered. And then you have your induced, which is household spending. So as a result of these jobs, you're able to spend in your household to be able to surge economic growth. That's how we stimulate the economy. So also, the majority of green jobs are made up of occupations not typically thought of as green. And these are your green collar occupations. How many of you have heard of blue collar jobs? So a blue collar job is essentially a green collar job. And if it's not one now, it will be soon. Um, and this is what we call a just transition. So green collar jobs are production jobs in green industries. And if you look at this chart down here, this gives you the sum total of all the green jobs that are in what we call the green job ecosystem. So we have the green collar jobs, which are more labor intensive, office operations, which are support roles. Believe it or not, a project manager can be a green job if you're working on a green project. Technical services, those are your engineers, software developers, IT support, and then there's all else. So these are what we call green adjacent jobs. These are jobs that may not necessarily be a green direct job, but these are all the other jobs that can come out of the green economy. We may not see those realized yet, but eventually they will turn into green jobs. And so now I'll turn it over to Mike to talk about um, high road green jobs. Yeah, so when we talk high road green jobs, uh, what we mean is better pay and benefits, uh, safe, environmentally conscious workplaces, and most importantly, perhaps most importantly in the long term, uh, ongoing professional development and training opportunities. And so we're very wary of having these participants go through our training and then get put in less than ideal situations where they're, you know, typically could be like exploitation or not opportunities for growth for people. Um, the good news is many of these green jobs are high road jobs. So the green jobs report, what we found is that green jobs pay approximately $28 per hour on average, uh, which is higher than the county average of, of 25. And they also have higher benefit packages, uh, partially because many of these jobs, you know, run through unions. And that's something that, you know, we've been strategizing on in our workforce development approach is how can we create a pipeline from our training programs into unions like say IBEW 11, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. And finally on this slide, you know, green jobs are available at all levels of education. And, and that's why I think you hear uh, when they're talked about in the news or, or elsewhere in public forums that they really are a vehicle to recover equitably from the pandemic because, you know, there's a lot of skills-based hiring that's available as opposed to you know, so many industries are so reliant on like the paper you hold and the degree you hold. And these hold a lot of promise by paying more and being more accessible just based on your skills alone. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. Oh, go and, ahead. oh okay, thanks. <laughs> and down that, that same vein, when we talk about green jobs, we talk about the promise, we talk, talk about opportunity, we really wanna take a big look at equity uh, while we know that there are tons of green jobs that are being created, there are existing green jobs and those that will be coming down the pipeline, but we want to be aware of the women that are represented in the green workforce. Um, although 50% of women are representative of the workforce in LA County, only 37% of those are represented in the green job or green economy space. And so in order for us to move the needle through workforce training, we're being very intentional, and we'll talk more about this in a minute, uh, making sure that we have all women cohorts of green job training. Um, and we'll talk more about it in a minute, but that's the way of us moving the needle to make sure not only women are represented, but people of color, LGBTQ plus veterans in this, what we call inclusive green economy. 
And later on, you can definitely take a look at some of, you know, the race and ethnicity, um, you know, um, percentages amongst, you know, Latinx, white, black, Asian, and all other. But just really wanted to highlight, you know, the inequities that we're really working on at Lacey to make sure that everyone is represented in this economy. And so now we're going to go a bit into key recommendations. So you've learned a little bit about the statistics um, around green jobs, but now we want to talk about the recommendations and how we're going to lay forth a course of action to make sure these um, come into fruition. And so there's four key recommendations from the green jobs report. And I would urge you all, in addition to the 200 um, page report that was presented earlier, um, some good weekend reading as our green jobs report as well. So the first the key recommendation is to accelerate economic recovery. Number two is to bolster the talent or workforce pipeline. The other is to advance diversity, equity, and inclusion. And last, but certainly not least, and arguably probably one of the most important, is to define green jobs and track metrics. So recommendation number one uh, is to accelerate economic recovery. Um, what this simply means is that we want to, number one, make sure that when we accelerate economic recovery at that $1.2 trillion bipartisan bill that um, President Biden and the administration presented um, becomes a reality. And there's nominal investment, not only the public purse, but also private entities as well. I got public purse from Mike. He said that like three months ago and I just rolled with it. I just thought it has so much impact. Um, but then also, we want to make sure that when we are accelerating economic recovery, we want to make certain that this 2.3 million jobs that can be created from that nominal investment um, also comes to fruition. We do know two things, that for every $1 million that's invested from public investment, it can create 7.5 full-time jobs. Every $1 million, it can create 15 jobs as a whole. And that's how we can accelerate economic recovery through public investments. The second recommendation is to bolster the workforce pipeline. So as I mentioned earlier, we can do that by convening a regional consortium of public and private partners to be able to convene this consortium where there's a concerted effort, there's a coordinated delivery system amongst ac academia, community colleges, universities, also workforce, labor, um, private, um, and also um, other industries at the table as well to make sure that there's apprenticeship programs that folks are basically earning while they're learning. And then also through articulation agreements, making sure that as folks are learning and they're going through workforce development programs, that they can also earn college credits as well. And this is how we imagine bolstering the workforce pipeline. And then also just making sure that shovel-ready projects, shovel-ready um, industries and workforce training programs are funded so that we can respond in a nimble way and move swiftly to ensure that folks are trained in an accelerated fashion. Recommendation number three is to advance equity and inclusion. We know there are inequities in the workforce, as I mentioned earlier, but in order to accomplish equity in the workforce, we are encouraging um, policymakers to ensure that it's a requirement that these major projects have project labor and community benefit agreements to make sure that BIPOC communities are at the table. The projects are going on in these local urban areas, but oftentimes there's not, the labor force is not representative of the community. So in order to make sure that we advance equity and inclusion, that's one of the key recommendations. Recommendation number four is clearly define green jobs and also track metrics. What does this mean? This means that we can all work off the same green job definition. According to the Bureau of Labor and Statistics, there are two working definitions that I presented earlier, but there's still a bit of confusion about what is a green job. 
and we all want to come to the conclusion about what that is. And then also, we want to track metrics to see how we are making progress. How are we moving the needle with ensuring that these green jobs are represented, that they have the SOC codes, the NAICS codes that are necessary to be able to tag these. Charger Help, one of our startups, um, has done a fantastic job with not only hiring and other startups as well. But Charger Help went as far as making sure that the EV network technician role was approved through the Department of Labor on ONET and now paying their technicians $30 an hour because it's an actual real job. And this is why we're asking the Secretary of Labor um, and the government to not only renew funding to update BLS, but also the Green Goods and Services database as well. And so in sum total, we want to accelerate economic recovery through job creation and continue public investment, bolster the workforce pipeline by having a more responsive and nimble workforce training, advance equity and inclusion to increase underrepresented populations in green industries through high road employment opportunities, as Mike mentioned, and last but not least, improve the evaluation of green energy or green industry performance. Um, any questions so far? No questions? All right. So now we'll talk a bit about enhancing community and what we do in terms of programming. So Lacey, as I mentioned, uh, we are enhancing communities. We want to make sure that everyone is engaged at every clean tech stage. And in order to make that happen, diversity, equity, and inclusion has to be in the forefront. So while we have these key recommendations, while we know what promise that green jobs can bring, we actually have to have programming to support the vision. And so diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives include diversifying, diversifying not only our, our founders pool of our Lacey startups, but then also our pipeline of women from underrepresented communities LGBTQ plus veterans, not only in our workforce development programs, but also in our startups as well. And then our clean tech pilots in disadvantaged communities. Uh, we've had a lot of pilots that have been deployed throughout Lamert Park, um, Huntington Park, Pacoima, um, and the list goes on, including a pilot in Watts uh, that is providing um, a car share program for local residents to be able to use an electric vehicle, pay a very small nominal fee to get back and forth to the store, and also providing first and last mile options as well to reduce carbon emissions. But then of course we're here really to focus on green jobs workforce development training. And so our green jobs workforce development program um, launched June of 2019 and it was formerly known as our Advanced Prototyping Center Fellowship Program. We realized that green jobs was much bigger than just manufacturing, and we're definitely happy and proud to be the stewards of the LaCrette's Innovation Campus, where we have nine labs from a wet lab to a machine shop, prototyping center, um, electrical uh, lab, and the list goes on. But we also know that green jobs also include uh, different trainings around clean energy as well. But nonetheless, our program is intended to provide under and unemployed participants from disadvantaged communities with the workforce training they need. We provide technical skills, industry recognized credentials. Um, you can see a few of these below, uh, OSHA, NFPA 70E and SOLIDWORKS. Simply means product development, electrical safety, and also workplace safety. Our APC fellows, our Green Job fellows, receive career coaching, placement services. Um, as Mike mentioned, we have practitioners and residents that we have brought on to provide case management. We have a career coach, and from time to time, we have different practitioners from the professional development industry to come in to provide additional input. And then we have hands-on training instruction by a team of training contractors, which have included, but not the exhaustive list of New Leap, Charger Help, Kidget, and Assist to Develop, which are all industry leaders that are helping to train our workforce pipeline. 
So this right here is a Green Jobs Workforce Training Testimonial. This is Maurice Gaither from our APC Fellowship, our Green Jobs Work uh, Fellowship Program from Cohort 5 that focused on electric vehicle maintenance. And just a bit of context here, we partnered with Los Angeles Trade Tech College, provided an accelerated EV technician program. Um, in five weeks, they earned three college credits and then was also transitioned into full-time roles with our startups. Uh-oh. <laughs> oh, you don't think it's going to play? Okay. Well, we uh, will we'll definitely have this slide available. And then also there's a YouTube link as well that we can provide you all to take a look at Maurice's video. But very inspiring, impactful. Um, and this really speaks to how we have a diverse pool of candidates whether you have a high school diploma, a two or four year college degree, we can meet you where you're at to help you to transition into the green economy. Um, and so real quick, before I turn it back over to Mike, uh, this is our workforce development program overview. I won't go all into detail, but there's two programs under the auspices of our green jobs workforce training. We have a fellowship, which is a little bit more rigorous, a longer time commitment kind of liken it to an actual college course, uh, whereas our green jobs training course is a little different. Kind of think of it as an extension course. Very short time span, you earn an industry recognized credential and you get a short internship just to get some work experience in the lay of the land of our startups and partner organizations. Um, these are very unique because we're trying to appeal to not only incumbent workers, um, matriculating college students, graduates, but then also those with just a high school diploma. And both programs are available to anyone, but based on our research, we have found that the fellowship program is really more catered to those that um, have at least a high school diploma are equivalent, whereas the Green Jobs Training Course for incumbent workers are typically um, for those that have a two-year college degree looking to make a transition, maybe have been in office operations for quite some time, and then some capacity have managed projects. But now you want an actual bona fide project management certificate. This is something that we can offer, be it a CAPM, which is you know, and more of an associate level of project management, or either your actual project management certificate as well. So progress to date, really quick, we launched in 2019. We've been able to graduate close to 170 fellows. All have received industry recognized credentials and about 70% are placed in gainful employment, um, post-secondary education or have gone on to open up a small practice um, or a small business in order to help them to advance into the green economy. And so now I'll kick it over to Mike to talk about some of our successes. Yeah, so this is like, this is what it's all about right here. So we have a few success examples of many, but you'll see it ranges by cohort here. So like Kelvin, for example, uh, with the LA City Department of Public Works or Marilyn with Envoy, uh, which focuses uh, you know, on charging, charging solutions. And you just see it goes on. Tyler, for instance, here is with Cerro Bikes, and so micro mobility, and that's actually a program that we're running right now, where uh, participants are trained in how to fix, maintain, repair e-scooters, e-bikes, all that you see in any community now, especially as summer's approaching, what they call like peak micro mobility season. And so one of my roles and, and FERG too is going to be to place our micro mobility training participants into full-time jobs. Uh, but these are success examples and, and this is why we come to work is to help people uh, get these jobs. All right, thank you, Mike. And in terms of demographics, um, I would say um, well beyond 80% of our participants um, are from BIPOC communities. Um, and in terms of education attainment, as you can see, it's pretty diverse. About 44% of our participants uh, have a bachelor's degree, 22% some college, around 20% high school, 
and then about 12% an associate's degree. Um, and so this really speaks to our program. We're very intentional about how we plan for programming. In some instances, we have two separate tracks. Uh, one track for those that want to kind of dive a bit deeper, um, and then another track that is really for those that want to get more, you know, entry level, um, green collar um, roles and jobs. And so uh, I say all that have to say that our program is for everyone. Um, and as you can see, in terms of, of age, it's a very diverse group of those. And we, as far as our eligibility requirements, um, 18 years of age and older, low to moderate income, um, Los Angeles County resident, um, and just you really have a passion for clean technology. And if you don't know what clean tech is, we'll, we'll tell you when you get to the info session. Um, and so we want to make our program available to anyone that's eager to become a part of the inclusive green economy. Um, and so now I'll kick it back over to Mike to talk about business partners and examples of success. Yeah, and, and this kind of gets into what we were saying earlier. It doesn't just want to place people in any job, but, but good ones. And so the line we draw with these high road green jobs, we define that as wages of $20 per hour or higher, uh, safe and environmentally conscious workplaces, and the opportunities for ongoing professional development. And there's not just like, we're saving businesses a lot of money by working with them. So we've put together kind of an overview of what benefits a business could get by entering into a hiring partnership with us. And first off, you know, we know how expensive recruitment and training costs can be. So we're already pre-training folks. We're saving you money on recruitment. Uh, that's a big one. Diversifying your workforce. You know, some startups are looking ahead to going public. There's going to be DEI initiatives they have to meet, corporate social responsibility initiatives that they have to meet. And, you know, by diversifying your workforce is not only the right thing to do, but it could also potentially enhance your investor relationships, uh, especially socially conscious investors. Uh, through our communications department, generate PR and brand value. Uh, again, that's, that's always important for, for any startup. And community benefit agreements, I mean, this is something we're starting to dive into more, but these community benefit agreements can prioritize giving projects to businesses that do have good track records of diversity, safe workplaces, paying good wages. Uh, so by doing this all, it's good business too. Uh, create volunteer opportunities for employees. You know, we had a company come and do a training with us a few weeks back on how to fix and maintain these e-scooters. And then finally, through our partnership with the America's Job Centers of California, you know, they offer a number of different subsidies, uh, whether it's like on the job training or youth at work training, uh, that helps. I mean, that really incentivizes getting uh, underrepresented groups into these jobs. Thank you, Mike. And we just want to give you a, a preview of our upcoming microgrid uh, training program as it relates to solar, battery, and storage. Uh, we're partnered with Arizona State University that's going to lead us in an eight-week training around microgrid systems as it relates to the operation, maintenance, troubleshooting, and the commissioning of these units. Our training actually starts on Monday. We'll kick it off with the Career Exploration Day. And by the way, you all are invited. We'll have food. Um, it's at 10 a.m. Um, at Lacey. And happy if you all want to want to join us. Uh, but nonetheless, we have another cohort coming up. If anyone is interested um, here in this room or tuning in virtually, our applications will um, be live um, probably sometime in June for cohort two. Um, and we'd love to have you. Um, like I mentioned, the eligibility requirements are very basic eligibility requirements. It's an eight-week training. We provide stipends. We do know folks have to live while they get trained. Um, and so we offer a $1,500 stipend for eight weeks. Not much, but it helps. And then if you advance to an internship, we offer $1,200 a month uh, over the course of three months, $3,600 to help you with any type of expenses. And we only require 20 hour a week commitment to the Lacey startup or to partner organizations. And Mike, our jobs pipeline manager, and our PIRs work very diligently to make sure that our folks are placed after the training. 
So some things just to stay up to date with the latest um, and the greatest about green jobs. If you want additional reading, uh, Working Nation is a very great platform that has provided some amazing content around green jobs and sustainability. Um, of course, Lacey's Green Jobs Report. Um, E2 is a great organization to get involved in. EMC Burning Glass and then also LA City Green New Deal and the LA County Sustainability Plan Report are all great reports to read about how we're advancing to make sure that we are living in a cleaner, greener, and more inclusive economy. And with that said, that's it for us, but wanted to open it up for any questions that you all might have. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a, a really great question. I'll answer that in two ways. Uh, the first way is that. Can you the question? Yes, absolutely. Um, so the question uh, from the audience is, does Lacey classify or point or, you know, basically define what an actual green job is? Um, and so the, the answer to that is we, we researched this through HRNA advisors. Um, they were our research partner. And a lot of the data that uh, was put into the report, of course, was framed um, within our own Lacey focus area. So all of this is based on clean energy, zero emission transportation, and smart and sustainable cities, um, which are our focus areas. But those definitions that we showed you are from the Bureau of Labor and Statistics. This data was researched in 2011 and it was published in 2013. And this is why we're urging um, Congress and um, trying to get support from Secretary of Labor to ensure that this information gets updated. So we don't necessarily classify what a green job is, but what we do know based on our research and our focus areas is that there are these jobs that are through line jobs. And we call through line jobs, jobs like software development, IT support, project management. We know every business uh, will need a project manager. Every business will need someone to help with IT software development. And so hopefully when we can get the BLS and green goods and services report updated, then we'll have more of a definitive way to define what an actual green job is. But based on our definition, um, a green job is something that is helping to reduce carbon emissions. At Lacey, um, we are all about you know zero emissions, clean energy, um, and smart and sustainable city. So I'm not sure if that answered your question, but I hope it helped. Okay, awesome. You're welcome. Yes. Yes, we've actually given that a lot of thought. Um, one thing that we realized is that the scheduling for our programs wasn't really conducive for you know the college calendar <laughs> um, because we're starting this one like right at the beginning, like after spring break. Um, and so we want to be more intentional moving forward of having programs during the summer break, during the spring break. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Um, come you know next year. But in the interim, I will say um, that we will have another workforce training program um, coming up in the fall. It will be an all women's EV network technician training um, around August. So hopefully that might fit the schedule. It's only a three week training. Um, and so we're definitely happy to give more information um, regarding that. Um, but yes, that's a really good question. Yes, 
Yes, it's uh, it's hybrid. Um, during the pandemic, it was completely virtual, but now we're trying to bring folks back into the campus. But yes, it is hybrid for our upcoming microgrid program and even for cohort two, we'll be on campus for about four weeks and virtual for the other half. Um, but we also will have a South LA location that hopefully will be launched around the fall um, to, for it to be more accessible to those folks that live in South LA. We were able to receive earmark from Senator Kamlajer Dove, who's the Senator for District 30 that asked us to open up a location in, in, in that area. Um, but if there's anyone that's interested, you know, that's out this way, um, like I said, it's a bit of a drive, but uh, we do have a hybrid experience where you only have to come on campus for, you know, a couple of few weeks. Any other questions? Hello? Okay, so um, I, is it true that if all the vehicles right now transitioned into electric, it would completely overwhelm the power grid? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. So that's, that's above my pay grade. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure if you want to chime in, Mike, but um, I don't know. I would imagine so, um, because there's still a lot of work that needs to be done with infrastructure. And I think that's really on the heels of the $1.2 trillion infrastructure package to make sure that you know, these goals that we have, lofty goals around zero emissions, carbon reduction, electric vehicles can be supported by the grid. Um, but I'm not sure if there's anything you wanna add, Mike. No, I mean, I don't totally know that as well, but Ferg mentioned Charger Help earlier, and they were at our event earlier today, and they mentioned that, I think it was like 30% of charging stations now are inoperable, so there's there's already the supply there, but they're just sitting broken. And that's why Charger Help's so important because they do this kind of on-demand fixing of charging stations. And I think that like California will invest a lot of money into updating its power system where it's able to handle like the, the amount of like power needed, as you said. Absolutely, but yeah, an incredible question. Yes, Professor Stone. Uh, was the statistic that um, the CARB has developed a regulation that would require that 35% of all new cars sold in California be EVs by 2026 and 68%, I think, by 2030 to get to the 100% by 2035 benchmark that Governor Newsom has set? Yes, absolutely. Thank you for, for that context, Professor Stone. And I think that that's one of the reasons why it's a I'm not gonna say it's a slow process, but there are benchmarks to make sure that we have the infrastructure necessary to support um, you know, all the innovation um, and technology coming down the pike. And I see a question back there as well. Um, okay, so I, I really support sustainability and like going green, but I have a question because it's also, you have to be very privileged to be green and, and sustainable. And I was wondering, like, are there ways to close that gap? Because I know, like, like people from, how do I say, like, I guess poor communities, um, like, they rely on things like fast food and they can't afford to be healthy the way maybe wealthier people are. Um, like, so is there a way to kind of close that gap? Yes, absolutely. Um, and I'm, I, I'm pretty sure you have a, a good answer for that as, as well, Mike. Um, I, just, I just think like as you keep growing and scaling up the amount that's available, that the price will inevitably come down. Um, you also see that cities are giving subsidies to communities of color where it is creating more accessible pathways. And so it is seemed to be a case that a lot of it is political will and directing subsidies to communities of color where they're able to, to access this stuff. Um, yeah. yeah, thank you, Mike. And in addition to that, you know, the only other way to really close that gap of privilege um, is number one, of course, awareness. Uh, at Lacey, we have um, a government relations team and on our team, we have those that manage our community partnerships. 
by engaging local community-based organizations to share more information about incentives and the technology and how to leverage and use it. We just received funding last year um, from the California Air Resource Board in partnership with LADOT uh, that's launching a universal mobility um, pilot or wallet to make sure that underrepresented communities have access to transportation and zero emission options. Uh, we had a micro mobility training program to make sure that the folks in the communities knew how to not only maintain but operate their e-bikes, e-scooters. Um, but then also I'll say the last thing that's most important is community wealth building. And the only way to build wealth in the communities is making sure that we have high road green jobs. We also support innovation and our startups to make sure that individuals that are from underserved communities have a chance of scaling their ideas um, and making awareness around that and making it feasible for folks to access these um, incubators and startup programs. Um, and so not to you know, dive off in the deep end, but at Lacey we have four different types of incubation programs, or I would say business programs, one being FBA. You don't have to be a green business or you know, have a sustainability lens, but we invite those in from local communities and we help them to transform their business to be more sustainable. And then our other three programs are all based on clean tech innovations. And so community wealth building really is the answer and also bringing awareness and providing access. Yes. So I love the ocean. I teach oceanography, <laughs> so um, I'm all for a blue economy, um, but a blue-green economy, right? There, um, there is so much, um, so many efforts happening um, to use the oceans more, right? To produce um, energy, um, be it wave energy or wind farms in the ocean or using kelp forests um, for biofuels. So I'm, I'm wondering how much Lacey is also involved with um, supporting internships and programs that are about the blue economy. Yes, that's a great question. Um, we do have, we do support uh, blue businesses at Lacey. Uh, one that comes to mind that was from our inaugural cohort of incubation is C-Trek that you know, really helped to harness energy from the water um, to be able to bring you know, energy. Um, and then also we just recently partnered with um, LA, the Port of LA and Altice, um on a grant proposal for Build Back Better um, so that we're not only supporting uh, green jobs, but also blue jobs, um, because we do understand that the blue economy um, is equally important, um, you know, with the green economy as well. Any other questions? Go for it. <laughs> yeah, so I have a question, and it, it goes back to the great question I think that was asked previously regarding bringing everyone along and making sure that this green economy is truly inclusive. You know, it's something like 20 to 30 percent of lower income families, um, I believe, uh, of their income essentially goes to utilities. Uh, are any of your startups in your incubators um, concerned or looking at this problem and attacking it with technology? Yes, that's a really great question. And um, I'm trying to think of the company that's helping to tackle that but I just cannot think of it right now, but it is one of our most recent um, incubation um, startups that's helping to bring education around utility bills and then making it more of a competition to help folks to save on their water bills. Um, I would also say that in addition to that, there's a company that we've incubated called Sci Life, uh, which is, um, installing technology to make sure that folks are able to not only monitor their water usage, but then also being able to shut the water off in the event of a flood or you know, a water leak in the, in, the, in the local household. So those are a few examples, but to answer your question, yes. And then also our sustainability lab as well, which 
is a portion of our uh, campus in which LADWP owns, and it has an education um, exhibit to show folks how to read their, their water and, and electric bills as well. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? All right, well, I really appreciate uh, your time. Thanks for inviting uh, Mike and I out and uh, look forward to coming back again. So with that, um, that concludes our program, but I hope that those of you who are here in person will take advantage of this opportunity to say hello to Mike and Daniel, and if you're interested in the opportunity they presented for Green Workforce Training uh, through Lacey, um, you'll get a business card from them or uh, whatever contact information uh, they have to pass along to you. And, um, You'll, you'll look into that as a potential career path for you. Um, that's a big part of the reason we brought them here. We brought them here mainly for Mount Sac students. And uh, we are also pursuing um, the development of, a, of an ongoing relationship with them for this purpose, for uh, developing opportunities for Mount Sac students to engage in green workforce training. Does anybody have any um, further comments that they would like to make or questions for our previous two speakers, uh, Professor Anders or um, Ira Baptavali? Well, in that case, I will uh, bid you all a happy Earth Day tomorrow and uh, you know, look forward to seeing you in the online world or on campus uh, during the rest of the semester. So, so long, everybody. Thanks for coming.